I invite you to stand for the reading of the Gospel. <coughs> Today it comes from Mark 1, 14 to 20. Now, after John the Baptist was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As Jesus went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending their nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. You may be seated. I was almost 14 years old, and my mom and dad presented me with an opportunity, an incredible opportunity. They told me that they were willing to send me to high school to the United States. Now, a good number of you have heard parts of this story. We lived in Monterey, Mexico, and the school in question was a small Presbyterian boarding school near the town of Corpus Christi in Texas which had, been, had had alumni in our home church in Monterey. In fact, we had long ties with that school. Uh, an aunt and uncle of mine had gone to that school, had graduated from that school a couple of decades, well, when they were younger, many years before I was around. My brother Hector, who at the time was around 30, lobbied my mom to let me go. By the way, the school, which is Presbyterian Pan American School, is one of the schools that you have supported through your offering in the Christmas Joy offering for many years. In fact, you invested in my education with scholarship money even before you knew me. The plan was for me to come to the United States. Again, it's a boarding school, so my whole family stayed behind. And it was for me to come and learn English, but I had to ramp up my English knowledge even before I came here. Uh, so I had to go to class one hour a day so after junior high classes were over, I would then take a bus to a local college and I would take English classes. And then this went on for about eight, nine months. For me, this was an exciting opportunity. In a way, though, I had no way of knowing what the future held for me. It was an, event, an adventure which would eventually lead to so many things, to so many blessings, to so many challenges. So it really was the beginning of a whole new life. I didn't realize that it would be a point of no return. I didn't realize that I would never go back home to live there again. But mom knew. I don't have a picture of that day when they dropped me off at the school. But I wish I did. I have it in my mind. It was a watershed day. My life from then on, I could characterize as before Pan Am and after Pan Am. I mean, sure, I still had a bedroom that I shared with my brother back in our home in Mexico. And sure, I would go there often, but it seemed like I was only there on vacations. <coughs> I've had conversations with some members of church who have had similar experiences. There was an opportunity, and they followed it. And things would never be the same for them again. In some cases, it involved moving out of state for, for school or for a job. Or there was a new relationship that changed things. Sometimes it was a tragedy that completely turned their world upside down. It's only been recently that my mom has owned up to a feeling of regret about my departure. Uh, to be clear, she never discouraged me from continuing in my adventures abroad. 
As I got older and as I went from high school then to college and then to seminary, all here in the States, my mom would long for me and for my other siblings who had also moved away <clears throat> for us all to come back home, to spend time together as a family during the holidays and the like. But, but these days, at 92 years old, with perhaps her emotional guard down a bit as time has passed, she admitted to me that she regrets that I left. Now, she's not shaming me, because believe me, I know when she's doing that. <laughs> Mijito, you should come home for Christmas. <laughs> Rather, it's like, it's like we're sitting at her kitchen table having a cup of coffee and noticing a scar on one's hand and thinking back about the time when that little line on the hand hurt and bled only even without the bleeding, that scar still has a kind of an ache to it all these years later. Hearing the gospel story today, I imagine that the mother of James and John had an emotional scar left behind after that day. I imagine that early that afternoon when Zebedee and the hired man came back home after a night of fishing and a morning of mending nets, Zebedee had to break the news about the two boys to his wife. The two boys, because they couldn't have been very old. The news that they had left home and followed a new teacher, a new rabbi. Maybe Zebedee was mad. I don't blame him. It was even more work for them. Already it was bad enough that they had had to hire people to get all the work done, and now there were two people down. It would mean more work for them. <coughs> more expense. Maybe Zebedee was ambivalent about it. Perhaps he thought, I give them a couple of days. These two, when they get hot and hungry and longing for mom's cooking, they'll be back in no time. But not their mom. I imagine she knew. I imagine that she almost looked into the future and knew. Oh, they won't be back, not for long, not for good. Often we read the words of Jesus calling the disciples and we ponder as Marietta was having the children think about how is it that they followed so readily, so immediately? Was he that convincing, that charismatic? Probably, I guess. I mean, all those miracles and his incredible teaching, that I bet that had to be compelling. But still, I'd say that even those who followed that immediately no idea what they were getting into. Maybe what was so appealing was that the words that Jesus was preaching created an invitation to walk through a threshold into a brand new start. This is what Jesus proclaimed. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. <coughs> Repent and believe in the good news. There's a lot to unpack in that. There's a, there's a sense of urgency and of perfect timing. No other time before or since will be as ideal as this because somehow God's influence, God's impact has become almost palpable. And so the invitation is to turn from the corrosive notion that we are in charge and instead to trust with all of our heart this, this good news of a God whose love for us knows no bounds. What does, what does God loving us feel like? What does God being in charge look like? They didn't know, but they could sense the newness that was being offered. And more than anything, they realized God was there nearer to them than they had ever imagined. We also have the story of Jonah today, the Madonna read, the people of Nineveh doing a 180 degree turn. And here, we actually have bad news preached to them. You will perish, the city will, will fall. Yet somehow God's spirit stirred in them with a deep and irreversible repentance. <coughs> 
which took everyone by surprise, including God. You probably recall some of this story about Jonah, right? The fish or the whale. The prophet that didn't want to go preach to the Ninevites, they were their sworn enemies. And that's when the whale captures Jonah because Jonah was heading in the opposite direction, regurgitates him on the beach. Gross. <laughs> Fact or fiction is besides the point. Jonah knew what would happen if the Ninevites took God seriously. They would change. They would go from being enemies to being a part of the family. Jonah knew that there would be a point of no return, even if the Ninevites were clueless about their momentous decision. While it's not every day that we have the momentous decisions, the starting of a new job or the forgiving of a sworn enemy, the lasting impact of Jesus' proclamation in the gospel today is that in our daily life, God is nearer to us than we realize. If we think of the reign of God as something far off or high up or way into the future, as something that we don't really ever have to face, it feels less urgent. It feels like there's nothing I need to tend to right now in relation to that. But that's not what Jesus is saying. The reign of God, the presence of God is, is within reach in everyday moments. In the Celtic tradition, they speak of thin moments. When the, divine, the, the divide between the divine and the human is, is as thin as a veil. When we suddenly find ourselves so close to God, it takes us by surprise. It takes their breath away. We live surrounded by these thin moments, by moments of such divine closeness that if we were in tune with them, we'd realize how often it is that God is trying to guide us, trying to bring us close, trying to bless us. But as our wise mothers could have predicted, those thin moments lead in life-changing directions because that's what happens when God gets a hold of us, truly. I know you've had moments in your life when God was surprisingly near in the comforting of